Good morning. Thank you, Cameron, for that beautiful prelude. I'm Pastor Danny Mata. Welcome to Murfreesboro United Methodist Church. It's good to be with you all this morning. We welcome you to worship. Uh, it's just us, uh, just our upfront team here, just eight of us here in the sanctuary, uh, streaming to you, and we pray that you uh, are pointed toward the Lord Jesus Christ and encouraged in your spirit this morning as we worship. Just a few announcements. Uh, we want to continue to remind everyone to expand our witness during this time. Please do love, don't just like, you know, love and share this worship service on your wall on Facebook so that we can keep getting that word out to more and more folks. And the reason we are streaming to you in this way rather uh, than uh, from inside with the congregation here is because, as you may have heard, we have voted as a church council to delay our indoor worship until August 16th. This was not an easy decision, but uh, the best advice of multiple of our medical professionals here in the church, they felt strongly that with the spiking individual day cases last week, that it would be very wise to delay coming indoors to worship together. So we praise the Lord for their wisdom and their insight, and we continue to rejoice and praise uh, Jesus' name together, all of us in his name. So uh, one big announcement uh, that we are pulling together uh, today, Sunday, uh, we're going to have a backpack attack from 10 to noon. We're wanting to collect uh, supplies for kids getting ready to go back to school. And of course, the school district is in the same situation the church is in. They still aren't sure 100% exactly what it's going to look like. But whenever kids get back to school, whatever it looks like, they're going to need supplies, whether they're at home or part-time in the classroom. So from 10 to noon, Sunday, August 2nd, uh, we will be receiving uh, supplies and donations. So even after you finish watching this live stream, there's still time to run to Walmart or uh, wherever you would like and grab some supplies. We have that list of the needs on Facebook and also on our church's website. So please uh, join in that ministry if you are able. Now I'm gonna ask the praise team to come forward and we are going to begin in worship together. We are, as you all know, in a very difficult time right now. All across our country, Christians everywhere are experiencing the same difficulties and frustrations that we are in uh, our worship and what we're able to do uh, together and uh, facing the same challenges. So many of us are, are afraid and fearful. So many of us are concerned about the future of our families, our businesses, our churches, our schools. In the midst of that, this morning, we wanted to gather and raise a hallelujah to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the middle of the storm, the song says, we want to raise a hallelujah. So please join me in the call to worship and let's praise the Lord this morning. I will praise you with the heart for your faithfulness, my God. I will, I will sing, sing praise to you with the lyre, the holy, holy one of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you. My tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Watch the 
Thanks be to God. And if you would, go to your comment section and greet one another. Good morning. Good morning. All right, join me in singing hymn number 102, Now Thank We All Our God, verse 1. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
At this time, I will share our prayer request. Barbara Zimmerman asks that we please keep Steve Tyson and his wife Kelly in your thoughts and prayers. Steve is currently in Carbondale Hospital experiencing some medical complications, but he has improved and is expected to go home tomorrow. Tina Shinsky asks for prayers for her friend Trina. Someone broke into Trina's apartment, caused a lot of damage, and took her cat. Donalyn Hornacek asks for prayers for Linda Kraft. This is her daughter-in-law's mother. Uh, Linda's been diagnosed with terminal cancer, and Donna also asks for prayers for herself for medical issues. Vanessa Lyerly asks for prayers for Paula Chapa, who had a knee replacement. Uh, she said she would love to receive cards from her UMC friends, and Paula's address has been placed in the online bulletin for your reference. And we have two white roses today on the altar. The first one celebrates the life of Norma Lindsay, aunt of Mike and Michelle Clark, who passed away on Sunday, July 26. And the second white rose celebrates the life of Lisa Gill, niece of Dick and Sharon Graff, and cousin of Jay Graff, who passed away on Wednesday, July 29. Please keep all these requests in your prayers this week and all those on our regular prayer requests as well. And thank you, Michelle. Friends, would you join me in prayer together this morning? Father God, as we just sang, we now thank you, our God, with our hearts, with our hands, and with our voices, because of the wondrous things that thou hast done, things in whom the whole world rejoices. Lord God, in the midst of everything, as we raise our hallelujah to you in the storms of this life, Lord, help us to remember each day to rejoice in you. Lord God, forgive me for the days when I'm discouraged. Lord, forgive me for the days when it's hard to put one foot in front of the next. And I don't think I'm alone in that feeling from time to time. Lord God, help us to join with all of creation in rejoicing over your great and mighty works. Those countless gifts of love you blessed us with all along the way in the midst of the storm. Lord, help us as your church, as your people, regardless of what congregation we regularly attend. Lord, help us, your people, to have the strength to love each other well and to support each other well, to care for each other in the midst of the storms. Lord God, we want to we wanna be your hands. We want to be your feet. We want to serve our community. Lord, we want to love your people. We want to intercede on behalf of the broken. Help us to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. This morning, give us open hearts to receive your word to grasp onto your living word with both hands and to go and to run with it, following your spirit. Send your spirit now. Touch each of our ears and hearts that we may hear, receive, and believe your truth this morning. Not my words, but your truth. Give each of us the discernment to tell the difference. And now aid us as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us turn now to the word of the Lord together. 
And let's see what great and precious gifts the Holy Spirit has for us this morning in his word. We uh, engage once again in our hero from last week. We got to hear about Philip last week. Uh, and this week we have another adventure involving Philip. So we're later on now in Acts chapter 8. This is 8 verse 26 through 40 this morning. And let's hear uh, how God is using Philip and how Philip is following the Holy Spirit in this text. Hear the word of the Lord. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candate, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, he was important, sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Please tell me, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. The word of God for the people of God. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Have any of you ever just wished that an angel would appear and literally just say, you know, go over there, you know, no, 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 10 more feet, 12 more feet, there, got it. And just literally tell us right where to go and exactly what to do. I have so many times in my life just craved for God to just use an audible voice every once in a while <laughs> and just tell me. Because And I pray from time to time, Lord, if you would just tell me exactly what you want me to do, I promise I'll do it. Just let me know exactly. So often there's a gift in the discernment process that the Spirit wants us to receive as we wrestle with God's Word and listen for His voice. And God knows best. But still, but still, wouldn't that be neat? Wouldn't that just be neat if God chose to communicate with us like He did with Philip that time? I think that would be pretty spiffy. Asa, would that be pretty spiffy? I think, I think that would be spiffy. So we want to be used of God. We want, I want to be his agent in this world, serving the kingdom of the Most High at his pleasure, going and coming, staying, moving on, speaking, refraining, all at his pleasure, all at his discretion. And this is part of why that account has always captured my imagination. See, the last week we talked about the importance of receiving the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Today, let's talk about how we can move in sync with the Holy Spirit. In other words, how we can go and run wherever the Spirit says. Go and run. There's a song that I dearly love, and if you have a chance this week, I encourage you to look it up and listen to it. It's called Lockstep. Lockstep by a group called Will Reagan and United Pursuit. Lockstep is this beautiful song, and it has these words of, uh, you know, lockstep with my God and King, move in perfect harmony. Almost picture a dance, a, a waltz, 
being in lockstep with God, moving in harmony with the Spirit. As the Spirit moves, so we move. See, Philip, in our account, was moving in sync with the Spirit, lockstep with the Holy Spirit of God. See, this is an account of action. You can't dance sitting down. I mean, you can try. You can try. You can tap your toe. You can bounce to the music. Okay. But it's hard to move in lockstep if you're stationary. It takes action. This is an account of action. Listen to these action words. Verse 29. The Spirit told Philip to go. To go. That's action. The Spirit then told Philip in verse 30, well, the Word tells us in verse 30 that Philip ran. Philip had to physically run to obey the Holy Spirit. He had to get right to where the Holy Spirit told him to be, right where the Holy Spirit wanted him. Action! Movement we see in this account. See, friends, we have a faith that has to be put into action. And I don't just mean physical running. Prayer, intercession, there's all sorts of things we'll talk about more as we go along, but our faith can't be a passive faith. It can't be a faith that sits on the shelf that we pull off and dust off, pull out and dust off from time to time. Faith, Christian faith, must be put into action. The Holy Spirit said, "There may be." This is basically in my mind and heart as I study this passage. What I feel like the Spirit is saying to Philip: Listen, there may be a heavy persecution on. But I'm telling you, go and run. Do my will regardless. Similarly, the Holy Spirit may be telling us, there may be a pandemic on, but if I tell you to go, are you ready? It's a faith of action, moving in sync, not with our heart, our will, our way, but with the Holy Spirit. See, because this brings up an important point. We're not to be spiritual loose cannons. We don't want to just uh, trump up in our own minds and in our own hearts what it means to be a Christian. Come up with that definition ourselves, and then run around doing stuff, messing things up and not moving in sync with the Spirit. We can't be random. We can't be reckless. The action, faith, this faith action must not be guided by our human impulses but guided by the Holy Spirit. So every time I say go, run, what I mean is not randomly, not haphazardly, not following our own heart, but guided by the Holy Spirit. Wherever you're at, sitting at home even, just say that. Say guided by the Holy Spirit. It's okay to be in the room and say it too. Yep, there's a few of us, just our stream team. See, Philip wasn't randomly running at people and trying to explain Isaiah to them. Like, hey, I see a person. I'm going to go hit him with the scroll of Isaiah and see what happens. Right? He wasn't being random. He was guided. See, our service to the kingdom of God will only be both effective for God and the blessing to us that God wants it to be if we are guided by his Holy Spirit. See, God can use us sometimes to bless others even when we have wrong motives. Sometimes God's word is powerful enough, his truth is powerful enough, he can even use a corrupt vessel from time to time. And there's times when I'm sure, I hope God has used me even in my weakness, even when my motives weren't right. But in order for us to receive the blessing God wants and for the message to be effective, we've got to be guided by the Holy Spirit. So I say again, go, run. We must not be passive. When I was meditating on this text, I was reminded of Paul's words to Timothy as well. Did you think of this? 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Action. Idle faith is no faith at all. Each of us, regardless of age, physical ability, or any other seemingly restrictive condition can be led by the Spirit into action for the kingdom. So that none of us are without excuse. But there's another scripture passage. See how the Bible just all works together. God calls us to put our faith into action. Always guided by His Holy Spirit. And here's one of the reasons. Our text shows us the importance of being in the right place at the right time. This is part of why it's so important that we're guided by the Holy Spirit. 
and not our own impulses. Being physically where God wants us to be, when he wants us to be there, so often can make all the difference, as was the case with the Ethiopian eunuch. The instructions were very specific, were they not? Go to the road, not just any road, the desert road. Which one? The one that goes south from Jerusalem to Gaza. God told Philip exactly where to be and when to be there right now. Go. Do you hunger to walk with the Spirit as Philip did? Does that fire your imagination? The possibility of living a life in lockstep with the Holy Spirit? See, two things about being in the right place at the right time. Pray to be walking in the Spirit. Ask for it. And pray for divine appointments. What am I talking about? First, walking in the Spirit. Pray regularly. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. In the morning, say, Lord, guide my steps today. Holy Spirit, come and take over. Help me to be right in the right place, right at the right time. Guide my steps according to your will. Help me to be right where you want me to be today so that I don't miss an opportunity to share your love and grace with whoever you've got in mind for me to share it with today. And don't let a day go by without praying that prayer or something similar. If you get in the morning, pray it at any point during your day. But ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, to guide your steps. And don't ever let it feel awkward. Praying to ask the Holy Spirit to guide your steps, this should be as natural as breathing, right? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, pneuma in Greek, right? It's the, and why do you, where do you think we get the term like a pneumatic drill, it's like an air drill or a pneumonia when you're having trouble with breathing. It's like the, the, the wind of the Spirit. It's natural. It's powerful. It's absolutely what we want to just blow with. Picture a ship at sail on the seas. It sails filled with the wind of the Holy Spirit to guide it where it will. That's walking with the Spirit. Pray for it. And then pray also for divine appointments. This was a divine appointment that we just saw in this text. There's no other way to, to put it. God had ordained that he wanted Philip to run into that Ethiopian union right there because God knew he was going to have that guy reading Isaiah or that he was going to be reading Isaiah. Who knows how God figures these things out in his sovereignty, right? But God knew it was going to go down. And God knew, hey, if I put Philip right there, this guy, this guy is going to accept the gospel of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And this guy is going to take it back with him in Ethiopia. And this is going to reap fruit for my kingdom. A divine appointment directed by the Holy Spirit. If we're walking with the Holy Spirit and asking his guidance, then trust that God will set up divine appointments, just like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. A divine appointment. And it all comes back to action. See, Philip, notice, now, I don't mean this to sound like a guilt trip. It probably will sound like a guilt trip, but I'm gonna say it anyway, just so you can see what I'm saying. I'm guilty, okay? This is not pointing the finger. Philip wasn't sitting on his couch with the remote control. Nothing wrong with watching some appropriate Netflix here and there, okay? But Philip wasn't sitting on his couch doing nothing when the Holy Spirit spoke to him and told him what to do, where to go. What was he doing? He was a missionary, he was out there he was preaching the gospel from town to town. See? He was moving, obeying, going, doing what God had called him to do. So then when God says, see, he's already moving, and then God says, here, you're south, down the road toward Gaza. He was already on the move, and the rest is history. I'm going to adapt an expression I've heard before. It's hard for God. Nothing's impossible with the Lord, so don't take this wrong. But it is hard for God to steer an anchored ship. If our ship is anchored, the ship of our life, how would we then expect God to guide and steer the ship of our life where he wants it to go and to fill our sails with the wind of his spirit? See? But if we're moving, if we're sailing, then God can be our rudder and guide us wherever he wants to take us. It's much easier then for God to guide a moving ship, action. But folks, I gotta tell you, people don't just become like Philip overnight. 
by accident. We can't just wake up one morning and snap our fingers and decide we want to live exactly like Philip. I'm not discouraging you from trying, by the way. We want to pray for those kind of gifts. But here's the encouragement. Philip was not a mature Christian out there moving, serving, obeying God by accident. And if Philip had not already studied, if he had not already been in the scriptures, if he had not been discipled, would he have been able to explain that passage in Isaiah to the Ethiopian? Now, God, now the Holy Spirit could have put the words in his mouth. But we know that Philip was identified as one of those men with wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. He had been in the church. He, he has been discipled by the apostles. He's learned and he's grown. I suggest that this shows us our need. This passage also illustrates our need for discipling ministry in the church. To be growing in our faith to the point where we can be on the move. We can be responsive to the Holy Spirit. We can uh, be ready to receive those divine appointments so we can walk in step with our God. See, verse 31, here's what I'm pegging this on. Remember, what does the Ethiopian eunuch ask? He kind of rhetorically asks, how can I understand what I'm reading unless someone explains it to me? Verse 31, how can I understand unless someone first explains it? Friends, I want to let you know that we're, we've been praying, a lot of our leadership, we've been praying here at Murfreesboro United Methodist Church about an, an exciting new discipleship opportunity that we're going to want to make available uh, this fall. Um, and I want to describe it to you just a little bit right now so that we can start to get excited. I'm going to say this phrase, and I hope we start to hear this more and more. We decided to call this, uh, this opportunity West Groups. Everybody say West Groups. West Groups. West is in short for Wesley, John Wesley. We're gonna, we want to root these uh, discipleship opportunities, these groups, in the classic biblical doctrine of the Methodist Church, uh, taught by John Wesley, inspired by the Holy Spirit, founded completely on Scripture. And here's sort of the, the, the three-pronged vision of what we're hoping to accomplish here. We're, we're, we're envisioning a home group opportunity called West Groups, where you can have this Anywhere, anytime, any age. We have three things. First, we want this to be a high-level discipleship opportunity. It's going to be teaching the core concepts of the faith found in Scripture from a Wesleyan perspective. It'll be weekly. We're going to be calling as many of you who are willing, both yourself and to invite others, to come and to engage in high-level discipleship. Discipleship meaning going higher in our praise toward Jesus, wider in our evangelism toward the world, closer in fellowship with other Christians, and deeper into the study of God's Word. So that's number one, high bar discipleship. But our West groups will also feature flexibility, especially with everything that's going on in our world today. These West groups are going to be it's like following Jesus today. It's kind of part of our, our thought here. The flexibility to be any age, any time. This will be an online resource that we create here Anywhere, you can do it solo, you can do it in groups, you can do it with your family, you can invite over some neighbors. Your West group can look like anything that God leads you for it to look like. On your own, in groups, at home, at a neighbor's house, in your dorm room at college, anywhere. So high-level discipleship, flexibility, and finally, especially with everything that's going on and not knowing how long we're going to be in phase four, safety. Really. Safety is going to be a key issue here because you can do this from home. Or, again, you can do it at a family member's house where you feel safe. You can engage in our West Group program. We're designing it so that you can engage with it literally anywhere. And it doesn't even have to be the same day of the week. It can be any day of the week. So we're very excited about our West Group's uh, concept that we've been praying about and dreaming up. And we can't wait to tell you more about it. But the need for discipling ministry is so key. The need to be bringing others along, making new disciples and growing the disciples who we already have, because both are vital. We can't just focus on making new disciples and not be growing as disciples ourselves, but we also don't want to just focus on growing our disciples here in our church and not bring in new. We've got to expand the kingdom of God. And to that point, on September 20th, we are going to engage with hundreds of churches all across America in Back to Church Sunday. That's September 20th. You may have seen the logo in our Compass newsletter for August that just came out. 
We are going to be getting more information out to you about that as well. And when I say back to church Sunday, we know what's going on in the world right now. So we don't just mean physically coming back to the church building. But we are going to make a congregation-wide effort to invite our friends, to even our own congregants, to get us all invited and to get back to engaging in the worship of Jesus Christ. So on September 20th, we will work with the Back to Church Sunday initiative and be part of that process together. We're excited about what God's doing in the midst of the storm. We raise our hallelujah nonetheless. Friends, both as individual Christians and as the church, we've got to get going again. To move in lockstep with God, running in the wind of the Holy Spirit toward the lost with the message of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Well, friends, as we get ready to sing our closing hymn this morning, the whole message that we have to study and to go forth and run with is bound up completely in the mighty works of God in Christ Jesus. So let us sing together. Hallelujah, let us sing.